that was so hot he did that with like a blast of magic i don't this is this is up there this is it's good <laughs> Sarah welcome back to another video here on my channel hope you guys are doing well we are jumping into the last part of our throne of glass series so this is going to be recapping the second half of kingdom of ash can't believe we're here but we did it this is crazy thank you guys so much for all the love on this series so far it's been awesome i'm so glad that so many of you have like used it as a way to like handle crescent city 3 and everything that video has also been doing really well we've been having like lots of talks down in the comments which has been so fun if you do have any suggestions for other book series right now um my top ones that i'm kind of looking at are percy jackson blood and ash and there's been a few other ones that aren't as long that i've been thinking about doing just like interesting book ones so if you have any other book recommendations just let me know down below i'm probably going to start shooting for like more book content to be coming out in april so all right let's talk about kingdom of ash so much is about to happen So I left you on the meanest cliffhanger ever, which was Elodie getting on the back of Kale's horse and like riding out into the field to go save Lorcan. We're going right back there, don't worry. We do learn though that Fenris, the reason why he couldn't just like winnow out to get Lorcan, which is what Rowan wanted him to do, was because Fenris has not been able to use his power since Connell, his brother, died. That was a power that they shared, and so he's not even sure he can do it anymore without Connell being alive. Elodie does find Lorcan, and it's incredible. She's like screaming for him. Him, and he finally just like lifts his hand out of a pile of bodies and we find out from his point of view that he was like laying there dying calling for her quietly and it's like he summoned her to come save him so it's really cute so they managed to get him up on the horse even though friendly reminder there's like a two three foot height difference between the two of them thank you ollie you're gonna sharpen your nails right now Thank you. So Lorcan's huge and Elodie's tiny and she's got that hurt ankle. So she's like hefting him up onto the horse and he's using the horse to like pull himself up like by the saddle and stuff, but they get him on the damn thing and then they start racing to the gate. He's basically just like dead weight though on the horse and he's slowing them down even though this is like, you know, Hellas's horse. So it's like powered by the like God of death and that's why it's come out to save him and all this stuff. He feels like I have to let you go. You've got to let me just like fall into the ground so that you can make it and the dam's gonna break and I'm gonna die, but you're gonna get inside. She's like, no, absolutely not. He goes, I love you. I've loved you from the moment you picked up that axe to kill the Ilkin, and I will be with you always. And she just like digs her nails into his arm and is like, no, and refuses to let him go. And they just barely make it back. They're like a mile from the gate when the freaking dam breaks. Aelin, meanwhile, she gets Bort to like take her in the talons of her ruck out to the field. They drop her off in the middle of the field while the wave is just like barreling towards them. Okay, so Rowan's watching from the castle and he's just like, well, there she goes, my wife's gonna die. <laughs> but instead she like boils the water in the hot springs even more and like uses her fire magic to basically boil all of the damn water into steam and save everyone on the field. Rowan realizes that she's been intentionally tunneling into her power this whole time. So while we thought like, oh, Fenris is right, they burned her, she doesn't wanna use her magic. She was actually just like, waiting and waiting and waiting to build up like a killing blow to use on Maeve and now she uses it here so what are we gonna do later you'll find out man we get one of my favorite man and Endorian scenes after this where she basically apologizes to him for like belittling him about wanting to go to Marath and everything and she's basically like what would I have to give you for you to stay? And he's like, I don't know, a really good offer. And she basically pitches marriage to him. And she's like, I'll marry you. And then our kingdoms will be united. And you'll have me like, I'll be I'll, I'll sacrifice myself to be with you. And she genuinely is like not being shitty about it. Like she she's trying to like make it political. But also she does like love him at this point. Okay, they haven't said it out loud, but like she does. So getting married to him is not like the end of the world for her. But she does use that phrase of like, it's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. And Dorian is like, 
bestie, babe, oh my god, you can't, no, like, we can't get married, you don't really want that, like, even if you want me, you don't want marriage, so no, we can't do that, but they do end up hooking up, and it's so romantic, it's such a good, cute scene for the two of them, because again, they do love each other, like, at this point, they're in love, they're just not saying it. And then in the morning, she wakes up and he's freaking gone. He went to Marath anyway. Remember how Adian is still fighting with Lysandra? Okay, they're still going. That fight's still going on. It's still going poorly. Everything is bad over there as far as they're concerned. They just get hit with everything constantly. <laughs> At the last possible second, Rolf arrives and he saves them with the fire lances and all of Adian's men like quickly get onto Rolf's boats so they're all gonna escape. They lose a lot of Ansel's people in this moment, like a lot of Ansel's men die and that's really upsetting for her. Don't worry though, her and Rolf have like a weird connection thing going on so like she's gonna be fine but she's sad. They're all now heading to Arenth. Lorcan wakes up Elodie is with him and she's like, did you mean everything you said? And he's like, yes, babe, and I will say it again. So then she also says she loves him and they kiss and they're like officially together. And it's, it's so cute. I, they are literally like grumpy and sunshine, except they kind of rotate. They switch back and forth of who's grumpy, who's sunshine. And I love that for them. Manon and the Krokens officially call for aid. The 13 at camp are like, yes, we stand with Manon, we will answer the call for war. And then we get this moment of all the other Krokens at camp being like, we will also answer the call to war, we stand with the queen. So they take like the seven hearth fires and start flying them off through to like call all the different clans together. And it's this huge long, I think it's like a whole, it's either the end of this chapter or its own little like mini chapter, but it's like several pages of like Krokens like going from house to house and village to village lighting the fires, everybody flying off to meet with Manon. And it's especially cool because most of them have been living with humans and the humans just had no idea this whole time. So they're all just like, oh my God, witches flying in the sky with red cloaks and broomsticks? How did we not see this coming? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how you didn't notice. <laughs> so after Aelin's like giant water steam situation, she is burnt out, okay? So they all kind of just like take a breather at Aniel to like recoup, because at this point, most of them have hit burnout or are like real close to it. Aelin lets Rowan in on part of her like big plan for help and everything. She basically sent letters to his family and a couple other important people to say like, hey, Maeve is Vogue, she kidnapped me, this is what's been going on, she needs to not be ruler anymore, just letting you know. FYI, she's evil. Hoping that Doranel will turn on Maeve and then those people will join Aelin instead. Kashin finally shows up with the foot soldiers. So now the siblings are all together. Hussar, Sartok, and Kashin are all in one place with Nesserin still. And they're all planning to like fight with Aelin too. Yurine is busy healing people that have been infected by the Vogue. It is working. She's able to save the soldiers as long as she gets to them in time. This is when Aelin starts to wonder about if Yurine could do this kind of healing magic, like on Erwin and Maeve, because technically they're Vogue. So could their magic be killed by Yurine in the same way the infection can be killed? Would it just be harder for her? She looks through the wordmark books that Kale and Yurine brought, but unfortunately there's nothing in there that helps. If I haven't mentioned the wild men of Aniel yet, they live in the mountains above Kale's home and they're basically like SJM's version of like Viking people. His dad is like really not cool with them and they call them like savages and all of the mean awful words. But Kale wants to work with them because they need to go through the mountains in order to get to like where Marath is at in a rent quicker. And the wild men are like, yeah, we'll help you, but you have to give us back some of our land. That's what we want in exchange. Kale's dad's like, we don't make deals with people like that. And Kale's like, I don't know who you think you are, but we will do anything to win this war. Be quiet. And because Kale technically outranks his dad, because even though his dad is still like Lord of Aniel and Kale's not really stepping into that role completely, he's the king's right hand. 
So get wrecked, Kale's dad. You are not in charge. He's so nasty. He shows Kale a trunk of letters from Kale's mom because remember, up until this point, Kale has told us, he's told himself, everything he's believed, okay, until right now, is that when he left, his parents and his little brother hated him from that moment forward and never wanted anything to do with him. And now his dad is like, oh yeah, no, your mom's been writing to you. Like, once a month for years since you left. I've been keeping all of her letters because I didn't think you deserved to know that she still cared about you. And Kale's just like, oh my, but he doesn't do anything. He like stays cool, calm and collected. And he's like, keep your stupid freaking letters. I'm still gonna work with the wild men and I will figure out what to do with mom later. The armies depart, okay? So most of them are going directly with Aelin to the north, but then some of them are gonna go with Kashin and they're gonna go to the Farian Gap and try to like fight there first to cut off the Iron Teeth so that hopefully once they all get to Arenth, the battle will be less bad. Love this moment because Aelin like goes to the front of the army and basically like turns herself into a big nightlight. And so they can all see her all the way down at like the back of the army and they know the queen is guiding them home. We've officially hit the second half of the book, which is called Gods and Gates. My sexy shape-shifting boyfriend sneaks into Marath and then he turns into a little mouse and starts scurrying around looking for stuff. He sees Maeve arrive at Marath to meet with Erewhon and he's like, oh. I'm in danger. Through Dorian's eyes, we learn that Maeve came to Erewhon to basically be like, surprise, surprise, I'm your brother's wife. I've been hiding here the whole time. Can I work with you now? Turns out Aelin's letters worked and now Maeve has been like dispatched as queen from Doranel. So she's just like alone looking for help. And she's like, Erewhon, I'll work with you and I'll give you my spiders and you can put the Vogue princesses that you've been struggling to put into bodies into them. And then we'll have giant spider demons too. We learn in this moment that Erewhon is planning on bringing his brothers back. So that's fun. He agrees to work with Maeve. He thinks it's a good idea. Dorian then follows Maeve to figure out where she's staying and he's trying to leave her room, but she catches him. And when I tell you, I freaking lost my mind the first time I read the end of that chapter, which is Maeve being like, you are not a very skilled spy, King of Adderlon. I almost passed away. I was like, if he dies right now, I can't do this. She just traps him and then like turns him back into himself so that he can like talk to her. Dorian's like, why didn't you just like, start screaming and tell him I'm here because he wants me so you could just give me over to him since you're so ready to work with Erewhon. And she's like, oh, baby boy, I wanna work with you. She's all flirty and to everyone's shock and horror, he is reciprocating the flirt on page, okay? He's like, oh, you think I'm handsome? You're not too bad yourself. Let him cook, just hold on. She wants the keys. And Dorian has them, but he did not bring them into the like Morath with them. He left them hidden a little bit far away up in the mountains. And she's basically just like, I know you're looking for the last one. I could help you get it. Also, you know, Aelin like doesn't want to do it, right? Like she's happy that you're doing this for her. She's happy you're gonna die instead of her. That's what she wants. She's a bad friend. And Dorian internally is like, get wrecked. Like, oh my God, shut up but he plays along to get Maeve to trust him. He says that if she's gonna work with him, he expects the spiders to be given to him instead of Erewhon, and then he'll marry her so that she can be queen of Adderlon and like have a new kingdom to rule over. And Maeve is like, yes, babe, that sounds like a great plan, I love it. Vernon is also chilling at Marath, so uh, Dorian ends up turning into him and then going into a meeting with Erewhon like a crazy person, okay? When Maeve finds out he did this, she's like, you have a suicide wish. And he's like, a little bit, yeah. He doesn't really find out anything in this conversation with Erewhon, it's more so for him to like face his fear and like be strong enough to like stand in front of him and deal with it. But we do learn that Erewhon like weirdly loves his brothers, like genuinely, like wants them back for like good family reasons. So there's like this weird empathy tingle where you're like, does the evil family just want to be back together? Like why, why can't they just go be together somewhere else? Why do they have to be together here and be evil? We could all get along if y'all would just leave. Adian and 
Lysandra make it to Rinth, we get a really sad scene of them in the throne room talking about how much they miss Aelin and how they wish she was here because they wanted to see her on the throne. Also, Daro still being terrible to Lysandra and Adian's trying to like keep that in check and everything. It's not going well because at this point Daro's still a piece of shit. Evangeline is also back though now so they're taking care of her too. Nesserin and Sartok fly over like to the Farian Gap because Kashin's got the foot soldiers and they brought some rucks with them but the witches are gone so that is very suspicious and very bad news for you guessed it Adian and Lysandra. Over with Adian and Lysandra, they manage to set a trap with some explosives and they blow up two of the three witch towers. But um, that army that's approaching them is a hundred thousand men. So they are screwed. Like, look me in the eyes. They are screwed. Gavriel have a little moment about talking about fatherhood. There's a lot of these weird random scenes where it's like she put them all together in a room and she said, oh, you two have things in common. Talk to each other for a minute. And personally, I love scenes like that. I know a lot of people get to a point where like, especially the last three books, like there's so much going on and so much of it is filler. I don't care. I, if we're going to have like fights and fights and then like filler in between, I'm good with that because I need those scenes. Okay. What I don't need is the freaking blue Akatar book that doesn't even live it lives at the bottom of my stack over here because it's like pathetic and sad and I don't like it. <laughs> I don't need a whole novella of filler, okay? But a chapter here or there, a couple nice scenes, I'm good with that. So Maeve brought six spiders to Erewhon and now there are Volg princesses inside of them, which is a sentence I don't like saying any more than you liked hearing, okay? But that's the truth of what we're doing. Talking spiders, evil Volg princesses inside of them. Nightmare fuel. Dorian is like scurrying around in his mouse form looking for the key, but instead he finds the tomb where Elena and Gavin put Erewhon in the beginning. And now it's kind of like a weird storage unit for all of the obsidian rings and the collars and the magic in there like almost makes Dorian pass out. He starts to like lose control of himself and it's not, I guess PTSD is like a good way of thinking about it. It's not literally like his trauma wakens up and that's why he's like, oh no, I'm gonna get sick. It's like the magic like starts to control him again because it's done it before. And so he starts like losing control of himself. But Maeve shows up and gets him out. And then we get another weird empathy tingle moment where she's like, that feeling you just had, that's why I left our world originally. So it's just like, why do they have to be evil? Like, it seems like they all wanted the same things and they just go about it in a really bad way. Dorian ends up convincing her to try to seduce Erewhon because at this point he's looked everywhere and he's like the key has got to be in his rooms so somebody's gonna have to get in there. Maeve agrees and then she tries to seduce him in her own skin and he doesn't like her so she like changes form I think to look like somebody that he liked in the past and he's basically just like girl if you want somebody to have sex with I'll send you a random human from Marath okay I'm not gonna do that you're my brother's wife and as we've established he loves his brothers so he's a good good guy he's not he's a terrible guy he's awful and yet he has a weird morality code about this it's it's so strange so Maeve the next day they have another meeting to try to like get back with him and like get in his good graces again and she basically is like I know I promised you the spiders she has to take them back now because she you know re-promised them to Dorian so she's like how about I open a portal and I show you your brothers Maeve is now planning to trick Erewhon with an illusion so she's gonna like fake show him his brothers and then like quickly open a portal for Dorian because Maeve is a world walker. Remember, she still has this power. So she opens up a little portal for Dorian so he can like flit into Erewhon's tower without going through the front door. In the tower, Dorian finds a girl who looks shockingly like Caltaine in Erewhon's bed 
with the freaking like word key in her arm. Just in case he runs into anybody in the tower, he's disguised himself as Erewhon. So the girl in the bed is terrified of him and he's like sick over giving her orders and stuff, but he's just trying to get the key out. So the one thing he does do though, is as he's cutting the key out of her arm, he like uses his healing magic to try to like make it hurt less and try to fix her a little bit. And in using that healing magic on her, it pushes the Vogg demon out of her a little bit and she's able to talk to him because she has a collar on. So she's been possessed this whole time. And in this moment, she's able to talk to Dorian and she starts begging him to kill her, which he can't do. He's too traumatized to do that. And he's like, I'm, I, I know it would be a mercy, but like, I can't, I don't know what to do. And he's going back and forth. And then Maeve shows up and breaks the girl's neck. Then she tries to mind control our boy to turn on him, but he freaking like Uno reverses her magic and starts controlling her instead. This is like the hottest thing he does. Okay, this is up there with shattering the glass castle. That was so hot. He did that with like a blast of magic. I don't, this is, this is up there. This is, it's good. He's got her frozen in front of him, right? Okay, so he's mind speaking to her at this point and she's just like, shaking with rage in front of him and he's just standing there all cool calm and collected looking adorable and he says that the whole time they've been together he has been studying her power to understand how it works and that's how he's able to do it now i love him she goes i'll kill you for this and he's like not if i kill you first and she's like you can't kill me and he goes you hurt my friend it will not be so very difficult to end you for it then under their feet like marath starts creaking and groaning and people start shouting and Maeve's like, what did you do? And he's like, oh my God, you thought the whole time I was running about the castle as a mouse, I was just looking for stuff? Huh? No, he freaking sent his ice magic into the foundations of the castle area. It's not a castle, it's like a keep, but he's been like putting his magic out and then he's planning on just like crushing it from the inside and just dropping everything down on them. He knows it won't kill Erewhon, but like it's gonna piss him off. So he gets away and Maeve is like stuck there begging him to let her go. Once he is like safely with the other two word keys and he's gotten all three of them and he can like see Marath in the distance, he lets her go, but he severs her ability to world walk and he goes, a world walker no longer. You better invest in some good shoes. <laughs> Like, I can't with him. Oh my God, also, he tells Maeve that she was stupid to think he would ever marry her because there's only one witch who will be his queen. Please, I, the man, the myth, the legend, I adore him more than anything, more than anything. He might be, solid chance, he might be my number one book boyfriend ever. I adore him. He's definitely my favorite SJM guy, hands down. with Aelin's group, Yurene has been like slowly getting closer with everybody and kind of learning stuff about them. And she offers to heal Elodie's foot, but she says it will be very painful because they're gonna have to re-break it and reset it. And that whole process is gonna take a while. Elodie is like, wow, I could walk again. That would be amazing but let's wait until we win the war and then we'll figure it out. They get interrupted from this conversation by Bort coming to them and being like, hey girl, we found your uncle and Aelin and the rest of them are holding him up there because they wanna know how you want them to kill him. And Elodie's like, 10 out of 10 incredible news, let's go. So Lorcan is like, I will kill him on sight for you. Would you like me to skin him alive first? Would you like me to cut off his arms and let him bleed to death? What about his tongue? He could choke on his own blood. How do you want him to die, Elodie? I'll do that for you, no problem. But Elodie is like, okay, baby, okay, calm down get information out of him first. So they try to like find things out and really it's just all the stuff we learned with Maeve already from Dorian finding it out. I talked about this with my husband a little bit. I think upon my reread of this book, this might be the only thing that's a little annoying because it's just repetitive a couple times because she split the groups up but then they all need to know the same information. The only time it's not annoying is when it's like Dorian and Aelin get back together and they update each other on what they know. And so we don't have to like read that conversation out, okay? But this is Dorian over here and Aelin over here finding out the same info, which gets a little annoying. They end up deciding not to kill him. Elodie is like, let's just leave him here and see what happens. So they chain him up 
and leave him locked in a room to just starve to death because that's what he was going to do to Elodie and that's what he did do like leave her in the tower where she was injured and alone and never took care of her. I think it's pretty sick and twisted and amazing. I love it for her. She feels a little guilty, okay, but she ends up like coming to the decision that like no, it is what he deserves. Because remember, he killed her dad. So like her mom died protecting Aelin. But the reason why Elodie's dad is dead is because Vernon was like, I want to be Lord of Paranth. So he like orchestrated his brother's death. Terrible. We get a Daro and Lysandra scene where it's starting to feel once again, like maybe we should feel some empathy tingles for him. And I just like, all the things he says in the beginning about Aelin and the way he like treats Lysandra, like it's hard for me to then be like, oh, you were in like a closeted queer relationship with one of Aelin's family members and so you were never really respected by the court and now you're grumpy because of that because you love this land and everything. I just feel like, dude, if you were like judged for things like that and you were struggling to like find your place in the world, why wouldn't you? love the band of ragtag idiots okay because if the answer is that you don't love them because no one loved you and so it's hard for you to like be okay with change cool get over it quicker okay because what it ends up feeling like is he's just an asshole he's just a grumpy old man who should not be in charge but he has been kind to evangeline so it's like he can't be terrible and we know that orlan was a good man so again he can't be terrible it's just like He's so annoying. Adian has some time with Evangeline, which is really sweet. He has like a, I don't know if I would say dad, okay? Like Lysandra really feels like Evangeline's mom in a lot of ways. Adian kind of feels like the big brother role to me more than like dad vibe. He's trying to keep her calm because she's just a kid and she like can't eat and she's throwing up. She's so scared of like the battle that's coming for them. She is basically gonna stay with Daro and be like his little runner. So like a little scout where she's gonna take messages through the castle to like keep him informed as the battle's going on. And hopefully that will keep her distracted so she doesn't see too much of the bad stuff. The battle is about to start and the thousand iron teeth witches that disappeared from the ferrying gap they've arrived so like it's bad they're planning on using the fire lances and everything but like they can't hold everybody back forever and it's it's gonna get really bad especially with the witch towers so he tells Lysandra that she needs to take Evangeline and escape down into the tunnels and that he loves her and he just wants her to survive but then freaking wyverns appear across the city and they just start landing on the battlements and everything all around Adian and it's Manon with 5,000 freaking crokins on either wyverns or brooms. Can you even? He's basically like beside himself like he fall I think he falls down on his knees. He does that a lot. He's a very dramatic boy okay but he's like gasping and he's like how many? How many? And he's like collapsing on the ground and Manon's like see for yourself and it's it's incredible okay that would be such a cool moment in the movie when this finally gets turned into something. This moment will be incredible. Dorian calls on Gavin one more time. They have a sweet moment. Um, it turns out that like the whole time Gavin was like encouraging him and stuff, he like fully and completely believed in him and Damaris like warms so that Dorian knows he's telling the truth because this whole time it kind of felt like Gavin was like angry or like not belittling, like that's the wrong word, but he just didn't seem to like really believe in Dorian and he was always kind of pushing for Aelin to be the one in charge. And now all of a sudden he's like, no dude, I've been proud of you this whole time. It just has sucked watching you suffer this much. But like, I love that you're doing this and that you're gonna help and you're gonna save Terrace and it's incredible. Dorian asks if they will be able to like talk to each other again once everything is over. And Gavin's like, I hope so. And it's, it's so cute because remember Dorian looked up to him and he thought like the stories about Gavin were incredible and that was the kind of king he wanted to be. This is the kind of filler I'm talking about. This is what I want.
Lysandra does not run away with Evangeline. Instead, she turns into a sea wyvern. She sneaks over into the river. And then once Marath's armies get close enough, she basically like fish flops onto the bank, mauls people to death, goes back in the water, moves a couple feet up, does it again repeatedly. The witches are all fighting in the air. So it's like chaos on all sides. Then a ladder smashes up onto the wall and a freaking Vogue Prince arrives and Adian has to fight him and it's going decently well until he gets freaking nicked in the armpit, which is so stupid. It's like Achilles heel situation level of dumb, okay? But the Vogue gets him in the armpit under his armor and it's a freaking poison blade because of course it is. So Adian's like, oh no. And he just like collapses onto the ground. Rin has to show up and kill the Vogue and then Adian is down for the count. He has to be sent to a healer because he got freaking poisoned. Back with Aelin, Rowan fixes her tattoo and he adds a new one for her that tells their story, which is adorable. Dorian shows up with the keys. <music> then we get to chapter 87, which is where Elodie and Lorcan finally make out. So, you know, this is, this is that moment. This is the moment where all of a sudden, after all these ridiculous sex scenes that we've had to deal with, okay, we get to the, like, seven pages. It's a long scene building up to them finally starting to make out. And Elodie says, show me everything. And then it just goes, so Lorcan did. Did what, SJM? What did he do? That's a criminal offense. Criminal offense. We go back to Lysandra and Adian, okay? She was in the tunnel system underneath Arenth, right? I told you that. She was coming out basically the moat situation in the front of the castle. They've realized, oh, there's tunnels under there. So now the army is trying to like overpower her and get through to go in underneath from the water. Iskra, is of course there and her and Manon finally have their final fight. It's like going decently evenly matched, except remember Abraxas is not very big, okay? He's just real smart and real clever and real strong. Her bull though, Iskra's wyvern is freaking huge and he ends up getting Abraxas by the throat and like shaking him around like a rag doll. Manon is literally screaming, please, please, like bellowing it, trying to get the bull to let him go, but it's not working. Abraxas is like, all right, girl, we free fallen because he's basically gonna like sacrifice himself and the bull in order for like Manon to get, I guess, live on impact is his goal. Like they're gonna crash still, but it'll, there'll be enough body on the ground for Manon to hopefully make the fall. But she's not gonna do that. She's like, absolutely not. I will not be going on without you. She tells him she loves him. And then she goes to jump over his back onto the other bull to like kill Iskra, which will definitely kill all of them because the bull's not gonna listen to Manon once Iskra's dead. Right at the last possible second, Petra shows up and saves Manon and Abraxas. So they rush off to help Lysandra. That was where they were going when Iskra attacked. Petra like free fall dives with Iskra, okay? And Iskra's alive and well, and she's yelling at her like, stop it, you're crazy. Let me go, let me go. And right at the last possible second, Petra goes, for Keely, and then she lets her go and makes it up as if she's been practicing this freaking move, okay? And Iskra just like kabooms onto the ground and explodes. Manon quickly gets Abraxas back over to the castle because he is very hurt, okay? He is not doing well. He's gonna live, but he's not doing well. Oh my God, we're already here. Prepare yourselves, okay? We've reached a very upsetting moment in the book. Here we go. So Marath has repaired one of the witch towers. Manon's like, no, 100% no, I will be getting over there and I will be blowing up that tower myself. Because at this point, they're aiming at the city. So they're just planning on just destroying Arenth and all the people and causing as much like mass damage as they can, not even really focusing on the armies. As Manon is like arguing, trying to get over there with the 13, all the girls just like get onto their wyverns and like salute her. And she's like, what are you guys doing? Asterin holds her by the face and goes, live Manon. And then just freaking sucker punches her in the stomach. So Manon goes down and they take off towards the tower without her. It is so heartbreaking. 11 of the 13 go down like around the tower in like a circle, but Astrin gets through and makes it into the tower. She kills the witch that was gonna do the yielding to make the explosion. 
and then all of the 13 make the yielding together and Astrin is able to like jump on Manon's grandma and take her out with her. So they all explode into light, not dark magic, light magic. They explode into light, the tower blows up and they all die along with their wyverns. All of them die. So Manon is still up on the castle wall with Abraxas watching this happen, unable to do anything, howling in pain. Since the wyverns die, Abraxas also loses his mate, so they're both just like devastated. It effectively stops the fighting for the day though, so Marath falls back and then everybody else like starts recovering. Manon is numb, okay? She just sits there on the castle wall and like looks out towards the field for a really long time and then finally she stands up and her and Abraxas walk because he's not healed enough to fly yet. So they walk out to the field all the way to the bomb site, and then they sit down together in the center. And slowly, everyone, okay, Adian, Lysandra, Gillis, the living Krokens that are still there, the whole army, and then all the people from the city bring these little white flowers and lay them on the bomb site. Are you kidding me right now? It's adorable and also it, I cry every time. It's so sad and it goes on and on and on. It's such a long scene. Oh, and then we immediately go back to Dorian showing up to Aelin and Kale and being like, hi guys, I found the three keys. We're good to go. We can forge the lock. But this means that he sees Kale for the first time. So Dorian's already excited to see him and basically teary-eyed because we know our boy is a sweet, sensitive man. I bet he's a Pisces. But Kale gets off the damn horse that he's riding on and runs the rest of the way to Dorian. So he's walking and that Dorian just loses it. And then they're both hugging each other and they're both crying. And it's just, it's so sweet. Dorian gets to meet Yareen. And he's surprised because Kale does go like, this is Yareen, she's the one that healed me. Also, she's my wife. And it literally says like, Dorian shot him a surprise look because it's like, bro, you got married without me? Like what? They all did. They all got married without you, honey. I will never get over the fact that they did that to you. Nobody even wrote you a letter to let you know. But he's so charming with Yareen, like immediately. And she's like, I've heard so much about you, your highness. And he goes, all bad things, I hope. And he winks at her. But then he like takes her hands and he says, I've always wanted a sister. And he kisses her on the cheek. And she says, well, then I bet you'll be happy to hear you're gonna be an uncle. And him and Aelin have the same reaction, which is like, you got this girl pregnant in the middle of a war. And Aelin like even walks up and is like, yeah, I know Dorian, it's ridiculous. I've been trying to tell them how stupid it was. I just, the energy of this group is everything to me. So this is what I was saying where this isn't as annoying because we just get like a line of like, Dorian filled them in on everything with Maeve and Aelin's like, yep, we already knew all of that. We need to decide what we're gonna do with the word keys in the lock now. Aelin wants to put it to a vote, whether to create the lock straight away, which would mean sacrificing Aelin, or to head to Terrison and then make the lock later if they have to, because they could potentially defeat Erewhon without making the lock. The group votes for the lock. Elodie is the only one who says, what's your vote, Aelin? And Aelin goes, it doesn't matter. So Rowan is pissed and terrified. He's so upset that everybody is so willing to sacrifice her. And I will say this now, Kale is also willing to sacrifice her, okay? That's a step in his like bad boy tally for me. I don't like that, that he's like, I don't want you to do it, but also my wife's pregnant, so Go ahead and kill yourself, Aelin. I don't want my wife to die. Kale, that's your best friend. Knock it off. So Rowan comes up with the idea that since they're all related, Dorian and Aelin share the same blood from Mala. So theoretically, they could both forge the lock and give up half of their life each. And then they wouldn't have to die. Neither one of them would have to die. So Aelin is like, you know what? That could 
work, there's a potential there for that to be a good idea. They go to Dorian, they wake him up, and she's like, I'm so sorry to even ask you this. And Dorian's like, girl, I'm sorry, I didn't think of it. Like, are we stupid? How did we let the giant fey idiot make this decision for us? So right then, that night, Rowan, Aelin, Dorian, and Kale, because Dorian wants Kale there, sneak off to the woods, and they're gonna perform the lock forging ceremony, even though they don't really know what they're doing. They sort of just like, wing it. They cut their palms, they put themselves in a word mark circle just in case, okay? So they're locked into this circle together. They cut their palms and then they hold hands and she puts the word keys into her arm. They dissolve into her blood because she has realized that in order to destroy the gate and close it, she's gonna have to be the gate. And then they sort of go into a trance. So they're still standing there in the present, but Kale and Rowan know that they're not in their bodies anymore. In that little dream world, they're kind of immediately thrown into like forging the lock, right? So all of their power is like funneling into this thing to make this artifact work. And they are dying and it is excruciatingly painful, okay? We get dual POVs from both of them. They're both in like horrific pain. Dorian says something like it feels like each like bit of him is unraveling thread by thread. Nightmare. Speaking of though, have you guys ever read like the Unwound series? What's that book? Hold on. The only book I have on my shelf behind me is Unholy and I think that was the third one. I'm gonna, editing me, we're gonna find out what those books were and I'm gonna put them on the screen right here. Tell me if you guys have read these. They're really good. So Dorian and Aelin, they're dying and then all of a sudden they hear stop and it's Dorian's dad, the king. He says he will pay the price because he has just enough magic in his blood to make him worth it. Aelin's like, what, what do you mean the price? And he goes, nameless because y'all don't know my name. My name got taken from me. I'm nameless now. We've only ever called him the king. Did you guys clock on to that? I know. So Dorian wants to just be like, dad, no. Like, no, leave it alone. I'm helping her. But Aelin tells Dorian that one of them has to rule. And she says to his dad, I was gonna do this before it got to the end. And his dad's like, then do it now. And she freaking kicks Dorian out. She lets go of him and like throws him back through the gate and he goes back in his body in the real world and he can't get back to her. So he starts freaking out, crying, screaming, throwing up, trying to like hold hands with her again. But now the wound on her hand is healed and he can't get back. Rowan realizes that this was the plan all along. And so she lied and he's devastated because he knows now he's gonna watch her just die right in front of him. The king gives Aelin a message from her parents saying that they love her and they're so proud of her. The lock finishes and the king vanishes. Aelin is not dead, but all of her magic from Mala is gone. And then 12 figures, Elena and the other freaking gods show up around Aelin. And they're like, hey girl, what's up? It's time for us to go home, send us home, do your job. But Aelin is Aelin, so she wants to make a deal. She basically is like, I want you to give back Elena's access to the afterworld so that she can be with Gavin, and then I will handle Erewhon, like we'll figure that out. But they get mad and they say that we don't make bargains and then they just kill Elena. So Elena just dissolves into ashes, never to be seen again ever, which we already knew was gonna happen, but it's very harsh. The gods go through the archway into their new land, happy to go home, but Mala stays behind and she gives Aelin a little bit of her magic again. She gives Aelin enough of a hint that Rowan tattooed word marks onto her body in the tattoo on purpose so that she could follow those home. So she basically is just like, go home Aelin, seal the gate and go home. So Aelin opens a portal to a hell world inside the god's world so that their world will just be full of monsters and then she seals the gate so they can't get back out and then just blasts her power into the lock and jumps into the gate to go home. This is the iconic like Aelin falls through worlds scene. This is when that happens. So she's like falling through time and space, basically. We, we don't know for sure how this all works, but she's falling through the different SJM worlds. She sees um, the Crescent City world, she sees Akatar, and this is the freaking hill I will die on, okay? She sees Reese and a heavily pregnant female next to him, and I am convinced that that's the only reason why Feyre had her baby when she did, because why? Did we get all of that talk about like, I wanna live my life first and I don't wanna have children yet and blah, blah, blah. And then immediately she's pregnant. No, 
Reese, though, in this moment, like, reaches out to Aelin with his magic, and it is enough to, like, slow her down so that she's able to get home back to Rowan. So she wakes up in her new body, okay? She's aware that her magic has changed. She says it's basically like an ember now, when before it was, like, crazy wildfire. Also, now she is, like, fully in a fey body. So, like, not the end of the world, because she wanted to be with Rowan anyway. People get really mad about Aelin losing her magic, okay? And I understand why because I know it's like specifically with like female uh, main characters it's a trope for like them to lose their magic by the end like they have to sacrifice their power for the greater good I don't know if I feel that way with Aelin just because her magic was tied to this prophecy like specifically you know what I mean so it's like it was from Mala anyway. It, it like I, f I feel like I would even feel different about it if Dorian's magic got taken because Dorian like was just born with that magic in him, right? But Aelin was like gifted it specifically for this purpose. So I don't know. I guess you could argue Dorian's is that way too, but I, it just doesn't bother me as much in this because she still does have it. It's just not like the god power anymore. Elodie and Aelin have a good talk now that everybody's like in recovery mode. It's clear they're gonna be closer friends. Like they have kind of a, it's not as fun as the relationship she has with Lysandra, but Elodie like deeply cares about Aelin and she wants Aelin to be queen because she's Aelin, not because of her like fun special powers. She gives her Silva's healing ring, which is gonna be very important later on. rent it's now been a week since the 13 died and the fighting is still going on it's getting bleak like I know I keep saying that but it's just getting worse and worse for them they have about four days left before they run out of everything and die Ansel tells Manon that at this point if they make it out she will share the waste with her no problem Murtaugh fought back to rally the men, okay? Because at this point, the lords have been like hiding inside. I say hiding. It feels like they're hiding. They're inside like running the armies, but they're not fighting at all. And Murtaugh's like, they need our help. So he goes out anyway, even though he's a freaking old man and he dies. So now Rin is heartbroken, but it is kind of like a martyr situation where now all the armies are like, oh, we have to, you know, avenge him. Da, da, da. So it's like a second win for everybody. Adian is heartbroken because he loved Murtaugh and he feels like he let Rin down and he let himself down and he can't believe they lost another man from like the older generation. He's so sad and like kicked puppy that Lysandra is like, oh, we can't have this. So she kisses him for the first time and it's real adorable. Unfortunately for all of you that hate the mate trope, okay, remember he's half fae. So immediately he's like, this one's mine, and like it locks in for them. So they're mates. Aelin gets a visit from the freaking Lord of the North himself. Like the giant white stag just shows up in front of her with the little folk, and they're like, girl, doom is headed for Arenth. You gotta go. We will take you there right now. Yeah, it's really bad. We cut back to Adian. The fire lances are out. They're screwed. Darrow chooses this moment, this moment of impending doom to be like, oh, you know what? I've changed my mind about you, Adian. Take your family sword back. Take back your titles. You deserve them. Lysandra, I'm gonna recognize you as a lady and I'm gonna let you keep that little bit of land that Aelin already promised you that I said you'd never own. You can have it. Also, Evangeline is incredible. I'm making her my heir. Now? Now is the time you wanna do that. You see why I wanna punch that old man in the face? so hard, just right in the face. I just wanna clock him one time and I think it would heal a lot of things wrong with me. Right as Adian and Lysandra are up on the battlements, making plans to die together in like a last stand situation, a horn blares and Aelin rides into the field on the Lord of the North, like on the white stag, okay? She rides in on him and her army is at her back. They're saved. The battle starts anew and it is so crazy. Okay, we're ping-ponging from all these different point of views across the battlefield. A wyvern attacks Aelin, but then Lysandra shows up in wyvern form and they get a moment of being like, oh my god, Vesti, I see you. I see you, girl. And it's so cute. Then Aelin and Ansel use um, ladders to like 
turn the catapults around and start blowing up the towers. And Rowan sees her from across the battlefield and he's like, oh my god, that's just like what she said Sam did in Skull's Bay. Ugh. And he takes the time to be like, I bet Sam is watching her smiling at this because she's so badass and we know she's badass and we both love her. I can't with Rowan Whitethorn, okay? They are on the battlefield and he's out here thinking about her dead ex because he knows how important he was to her. The rest of the Iron Teeth arrive, which is like big bad. Gavriel shows up and immediately goes looking for Adian. He explains everything with the gate and what happened with Aelin and that they still, you know, have to fight Erewhon, but at least she's alive and everything's gonna hopefully be okay. Adian's like, okay, wonderful. We have to close this damn gate because if they get into the city, all these people are gonna die. So help me close the gate. And Gavriel like, I got you, son. Don't worry. At this point, Adian's feeling like, maybe my dad is not so bad. Like, maybe I could forgive him. Maybe I'm healing slowly towards the wound he left me with, which can only mean one thing. Would you like to guess what that one thing is? Yeah, so they're trying to seal the gate, and they're supposed to do it together. That's what Gavriel said they were gonna do. And then he goes, close the gate, Adian. Close it. And he stays on the outside while Adian goes in and pushes the gate closed with his men. Adian tries to run up to the top of the tower to like dive off the other side and go help him. But by the time he gets there, he sees Gavriel dead on the ground. What? Aelin, meanwhile, is over on the other side. Okay, she's by the southern gate with Maeve, Erewhon, and the six freaking spiders. Aelin starts like picking on them and basically being like, you were gonna turn on her, you were gonna turn on him. So she's trying to get them to argue because she loves to stir up chaos as a distraction method. This is that moment that everybody talks about where she unleashes her power after looking them dead in the eye and going, I am a god. She's incredible. So she's like imploding over here by the southern gate, right? And everybody can see her doing that from wherever they're at. So Lorcan, Rowan, and Fenris are like, we gotta go because they're blood sworn to her. So they start taking off to go help her. As they get there, an Ilkin demon shows up and like plucks Erewhon away and takes him off across the field. He's going off to kill a healer because there's like healing magic blasting from a certain spot on the field and that's where he goes. But it's Yurene and she's tricking him, okay? Elodie had an idea and they went to Dorian and Kale and were like, we have to take Yurene to do this thing. And Kale was like, Dorian, if anything happens to my wife, I will never forgive you. And Dorian was like, I will protect her with my life, brother, I promise. And so Dorian, Elodie, and Yurene are over here doing this thing with Erewhon, right? And Kale is still fighting, I think on his horse down on the ground. Maeve like gets Aelin and like has her on the ground and is like, swear the blood oath to me right now. Rowan, Lorcan, and Fenris all get there and Maeve is like, if you won't do it for me, maybe you'll do it for them. And then she attacks them with her power and we read the lines, everyone started screaming. Rowan started screaming. Oh no, it's bad. We go back to Erewhon, he's with Yurene. He says he's been looking for her. He's been trying to like pluck out the healers and kill them one by one because she's right. Her power can destroy him. Back in their world, they have people like her. They call them Death Maidens. It's a badass name. Turns out that healers are the ones they use to like unbind the word gate and make the damn keys. He might be super evil and like the big bad of this world, but he is still simply just a man and he gets stuck on a damn word mark trap. And then Yurene goes, I am not Yurene. And her eyes turn from Hazel to Sapphire and it's freaking Dorian in disguise. Shut up, I love him. And then Yurene pops out. Okay, so Dorian's holding Erewhon in place with that word key and his power and Yurene starts just blasting him with her healing magic. Dorian cuts his hand and cuts her hand and gives her his power since his power is so badass and sexy. In this moment, Dorian makes Erewhon tell him his dad's name and Erewhon admits that his name was Dorian too. He says he took everything from him. He took his name and the only time King Dorian ever knew what it was and remembered it was when he looked at baby Dorian for the first time and named him. I want to die. I want to go somewhere else far away. And then they freaking kill Erewhon, okay? So Yurene gets it out of him and kills him and then Dorian burns his body into ash. 
So Maeve has the boys pinned down under her scary magic power. Rowan is seeing Aelin dead. I'm pretty sure he sees her like impaled on the Arenth gates, which is nightmare fuel. Fenris is with Connell and Connell's basically saying like, you did this, it's your fault. You're a terrible brother, I hate you. And then Lorcan is with Elodie and she's like, I don't like you, I never liked you. I'm not in love with you, you suck. And he just sort of gives in and gives up and is like, yeah, that tracks, I believe that. Aelin blasts her power over at the boys to like free them from Maeve's clutches. Fenris is deeply hurt, okay? Deeply, deeply very bad. And then, Aelin starts like opening portals, okay, for like uh, the missing Fae from the north that we didn't know where they went this whole time. She found them, she brought them. They're uh, wolf riders too, so like there's a lot of new people joining the battlefield fighting Maeve's armies. Aelin and Rowan distract Maeve by like joining their power and basically like exploding together. While they're doing that, Aelin's looking at Fenris and blinking at him four times to get him to wake up, which remember the four time blink means I am here, I am with you. It wakes Fenris up and right as they go to explode, he blinks yes at her. Wait for it. Maeve is like too focused on Rowan and Aelin attacking her from the front that she doesn't think to check behind her. And freaking Fenris, who Aelin says has a score to settle, gets behind Maeve and just stabs her through the heart with Aelin's sword. Then Aelin puts Silva's ring onto Maeve's finger, which starts like decaying her right in front of them. And finally, Aelin beheads her. At her death, because now Erewhon and Maeve are gone and there's no more Valg presence in the world, all of the monsters just drop. We get to see this from Nesserin's point of view. We like go back over to her. Her and Sartok and um, Euron and Bort have all been fighting together like up on the rucks, but they're all okay. And we get to see Nesserin and Sartok like come together and be like, wow, we did it. And Sartok goes, you know what victory means, don't you? And she goes, hopefully a really long nap. I'm exhausted. And he goes, it means we're going home. It means you are going home with me. Aelin finally goes into a rent, okay? She's not been inside the gates yet since she ran away as a little girl. Everyone is there. They all are like so excited to have her back, like the city, the armies. It's so cool. Daro officially is like, you are our queen. Falcon and Lysandra meet. He tells her everything and she immediately is like, oh my god, I have family. This is the coolest thing ever because up until this point, she's been alone. So she's made friends, you know, and she loves Aelin, she loves Adian, all of that. But now, like, she's got blood family with her for the first time in years. Dorian finds Manon and he looks above her for the 13 and she says, you will not find them in this sky or any other. She doesn't really like cry, cry, it's Manon. You know what I mean? Like she already did that on the battlefield and that was a big deal for her, but she just like leans into him and he holds her and he says that he's so sorry. And she just goes, I miss them. And then she sees Elodie. So now they're both alive and that's a really sweet moment. But Elodie sees the look on Manon's face and goes, how many? And Manon goes, all. Aelin gives Gavriel the blood oath in death. It is so sweet. Rowan and Lorcan sing to him. They basically give him like a fey funeral, okay? It's just them and then Adian. And do y'all remember Vaughn? Do you remember Vaughn? Mm-hmm. He's the other member of Maeve's little band of dudes. SJM forgot about him. So he didn't come back for the fight, okay? I shouldn't even be mentioning to you now. We mentioned him at the very end. Fenris goes, oh, did you guys forget about our friend Vaughn? And it's literally like the third to last page of the book. SJM certainly forgot about him, but it's okay. He's out there somewhere. Maybe we'll see him again one day. I don't know. Lorcan asks Elodie to ask him to stay with her in Paranth and marry her. And she does. And he says yes. And then he's like, oh, I'm so excited. This is the best. When we get married, I'm going to bind my life to yours so that I'll die when you die. Is that okay? And she's like, that's perfect. Also, his name is now Lord Lorcan Locken. Terrible. <laughs> 
that's why ahead of the game you got to think about who people are going to marry okay you got to have ideas in your head of where that's going because lord lorkin lockin are you serious are you for real at least he laughs at it he immediately is like yeah that's trash that's terrible but you're worth it Yareen is now planning to start her own tour over in the north, which is so sweet because that's what Hephaestia wanted for her in the south. So now she's going to do that here with her own people and Hephaestia says she'll be great at it. Also, Hephaestia made it through the battle. She didn't die. The Crokins come to Manon and tell her that flowers are freaking blooming in the wastes so they can go home. The curse is broken. Rowan's cousin Celine, who we've really not talked about, okay, they don't do a lot. They've just been fighting with Adian this whole time. She is gonna be Queen of Doranel, so Aelin doesn't have to have that title. Also, he's a wealthy prince again, and now that Maeve is dead, all the Whitethorn money goes back to him. So he promises Aelin a royal library and a theater, because Arinth didn't used to have a theater, that was just a Rifthold thing, but now she's gonna get both, and she's very excited. Aelin and Manon have a moment, because everybody's celebrating, and Manon is still so deeply fucked up because nobody died, okay? Nobody died except for Adian's dad and Murtaugh and the 13. So Aelin goes to her and is like, we're making a monument right where they died, okay? Like on the blast site so no one will ever forget them. Which the blast site is basically like the front yard of Arenth, so a big deal to just put something there. Aelin has her coronation to be queen of Terrison. Her crown is made like in a handful of days and it's basically like twisted branches because the antler crown and the antler throne are both gone. But This is like the new one that they make. And instead of putting a gem on it, they put the king's flame, like paperweight basically, that uh, Darrow was keeping from Orlon's reign. Okay, this is when I was saying the whole like, are we supposed to feel sympathy for him? He gives that to her and that's in her crown now. Listen, she is stronger than me because I'd have been like, no, keep it. I'll grow my own. At the coronation though, Adian gets to uh, swear the blood oath in front of everybody and he's elated. The little folk then show up and some of the people in the room are like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, what's happening? And they're lightly afraid, but they just run up to Aelin and give her Mab's crown. And she takes it and she's like, okay, I'll be your queen too. So now she's queen of Terrison, but also the fae queen of the West. Man, dudes. And then she goes to walk outside to walk through the streets and like greet everyone. And she brings all of her girls with her. Okay, so like Yureen, Manon, Elodie, Evangeline, Lysandra, all of them, Ansel, Nesserin, they all get to go with her. It's, it's the best. We find out that some of Sartok's Ruck Riders found Wyvern eggs. So they kind of want to stay for a little while if it's okay with him and help teach the wyverns to like not be crazy psychos and help teach people to ride them. Kale's mom writes to him and is basically like, hey honey, your dad told me what he did to our letters. I'm so sorry that you thought we forgot about you, okay? I have always loved you. I've always been proud of you. And when you're ready, me and your brother would love to come see you because we're telling your dad to get fucked and we're not going home. <laughs> And Kale is like so touched and excited and he just turns to Yurene and goes, we're gonna need to build a bigger house. That is one of my favorite Kale moments, okay? There's just something so wholesome about we're gonna need to build a bigger house. It's so cute. Dorian and Manon talk. He tells her about the whole Wyvern getting trained by the Ruck Riders situation. Basically his plan is for those people that learn to ride them to be his new aerial legion because he's a witch king, okay? And he's all about the wyverns now. So he needs Manon to come back and help a little bit with that. And she agrees. She's like, it's gonna be a little difficult since I like live in the waste, but like, sure, of course. And Yurene just goes, you know, you guys could just get married and then it would be a little easier for both of you. And Kale is like, oh my God. And Dorian is just like, Yurene. Don't scare her away, be quiet. And Manon just gets onto Abraxas, looks at Dorian and goes, we'll see, and then flies away. Are you joking right now? I know he wanted to pass out. I know he said to himself, we'll see. And he just thought about that for weeks, months until he saw her again. Like, 
oh my god basically now at this point we're like dwindling right to the end okay and everybody's starting to leave we get like a chapter of goodbyes it's very emotional and the saddest one is the damn trio goodbye okay because they don't live together anymore so i'm pretty sure kale and dorian are gonna live in rift hold together with yurin and probably be in the castle so the boys will see each other all the time okay even if kale has to go from annie ellen back like they're still really close to each other but freaking Aelin lives in Terrison now, so like they're not together anymore. But they basically, you know, promise to love each other forever and they're always gonna be bonded and they're always gonna be best friends and they are gonna see each other. And I'm a firm believer that Aelin, you know, obviously settled and is in a fey body. Dorian is too overpowered for me to believe that he is gonna have anything but at least a thousand years in him, all right? So I refuse anything else. Kale's a human. Kale's a human, he's gonna die. And that's very sad for all of you that love Kale and it's very sad for Dorian and Aelin, but I my boy Dorian can't die, okay? <laughs> he cannot have a regular normal life. I refuse to believe that he's only got like 40 more years, 50 more years. Uh, no. The last little chapter is called Afterworld. Lorcan and Elodie got married, so his name is officially Lord Lorcan Lockin, and everyone makes fun of him for it. Don't worry. Adian and Lysandra are also engaged. The book ends with Aelin waking up in bed in her room with Rowan, happy and content she goes out onto the balcony and then she calls for him when he comes outside he sees that the king's flame is blooming and he goes it's for you fireheart it's all for you shut up shut up I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to like and comment down below. I love talking to y'all. This is such a crazy book series, okay? I love these books so much. I've got Kingdom of Ash just like sitting down here with me. I I just love them. They're so good. Even though if you've watched these and you haven't read them, I look, you still should, okay? They're good. They're good books. They're the best SJM's written, in my opinion. And I'm a girl who loves Akatar a lot, okay? But there's just something about these guys. There's just something about them. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you so soon. Have a good one. Bye!